Let's talk bubble logging for a little bit. So, all, and I put internet info question mark because all information you see on the internet isn't exactly true or accurate. Bobber dogging has become something a lot of folks do and for good reason. It's a great way to learn to fish, but it's also a great way to just simply find fish and cover water. And so when I'm drift fishing and I'm doing that grid pattern search and that, that line pendulums on in, that's a method. But with a bobber, whether I have a spinning rod or a bait caster, I can simply release open line and as long as that float keeps going down river, I'm extending my drift. Make sense? The float and the weight work in unison. Barber dogging is not ever fishing suspended. We're not talking about hanging bait over the fish. Okay, we're talking about weight is in contact with bottom and the float is on the surface and you have both the surface current and the bottom structure and current and channels that are made between rock structures and logs and things. It basically works in unison, drag and bottom and current on top and it pushes your presentation, believe it or not, right down the travel lane where the fish are. You eliminate, go ahead. Oh, back to the, uh, your reel. You know, if we're doing this and you're just flipping it out there, well, I have a tendency to do a little rat's nest. So I go keep going back to my spinning rods. Okay. Yeah, is there a way to set it up? Practice. Yeah. <laughs> Practice, you know. I mean, it gets to the point where when you get tendonitis in your right arm so bad you can't fish, you got to start teaching yourself to cast year. left handed with your bait <laughs> caster. And the first couple of times your backlash, your dad looks like it goes, your husband fish? <laughs> Ma'am, so um, had to eat that one. But uh, bobber dogging is a great technique that's been around for quite a while now. We were we were bobber dogging, gosh, 12, 14 years ago when not many folks were talking about it. And it's changed. I mean, we used full size floats before. We've uh, we used you know slinky leads. We use uh, solid lead. We use little teardrop leads with swivels. I mean, we tried a lot of things. And uh, JP was uh, involved in helping BOMAC uh, early back in the day create some of these bobber dog floats to his credit. And they've come a long ways now. These, these newer floats are nice because they're actually cupped on the bottom end so that they, keep in mind, the, the current is pushing this bobber down river. So if we have a torpedo style float, that's a short float, um, so that's laying on top of the water, and yeah, the current's moving it along, but since we've changed to bobbers that are conducive to actually collecting water and pushing your presentation down river, it's been a game changer. Um, the reasons for bobber dogging are pretty simple, and I think I've, I think I've mentioned a few. You're going you're gonna to cover water quite a bit more in that you can extend your drift. Of course, I've wrapped on it. Um, you can extend your drift, and... Continuous, if you're in a boat, if you're in a boat, albeit a sled or a drift boat, and you are side drifting, which popular for years and a lot of folks still do it, and at times it has its place, you're fishing out the back of the boat 45 degrees, eventually your presentation, again, is going to pendulum in behind the boat and you got to recast. Mm -hmm. If you're bobber dogging and you throw it out there in the current scene, and depending who's running the boat, and it's going in and out along the shoreline or in and away from the current seam, you can either collect line or let out line and maintain that bobber going right down the travel lane of the fish. There is no pendulum. The, the current continues to push the bobber downstream. Let me back up to this photo here. So that's inaccurate. Yes, the float would be downriver. The weight's dragging behind, that is accurate, but the presentation of your bait is actually forward because mm -hmm. it's lighter than your bait. Anybody disagree with that? Oh. So, when I say internet info question mark, just, you know, take it in, kind of look at it. If it makes sense to you, great. If you can see that, well, wait a second. If I'm bobber dogging a rag with foam, chances are it's lighter than that lead. If it's lighter than the lead, just my, like the bobber, it's got to be pushed down river ahead of it, correct? So, um, the thing about bobber dogging is we're not suspending our bait, so our bobber stop, and we like, I like to use these BOMAC little egg bobber stops because I'm on a filament, they grab really well. You're setting that about eight feet up your line, okay? If I lower this down to a foot or so above the bobber, when that bobber comes up and stops, that weight is hanging like that, and if the water is six or eight feet deep, my presentation is right there. Mm -hmm. Okay? The key is to get your weight on the bottom, not the bait on the bottom. So this is essentially drift fishing with a float. 
If you're in a boat, we call it bobber dogging. If I'm standing on the shoreline, I've always referred to it as uh, float drifting because I'm literally drift fishing with a float. And you can work that same piece of water like drift fishing that you can bobber dog style or float drift style. You're going to cast in the river, current's going to push the bobber down towards you, you're going to collect your uh, slack. If you're fishing it correctly and you keep about a foot of slack or a little loop of line around your float, you're actually going to feel your weight tap and bottom. <clears throat> if you're not feeling your weight tap and bottom and you've got a whole bunch of line out on top of the water, you're doing it wrong. Okay? Now the difference is, <clears throat> if you're fishing a floating jig and that bobber disappears, you're probably setting the hook. If you're bobber dogging and that float disappears and you set the hook, you're going to miss that fish. Because, hold on a second. <clears throat> Quick drink. Somebody else want to talk? I've been talking for a long time. <laughs> If the bobber disappears and you set the hook, you're going to miss the fish because we have at least eight feet of line that is under the water. It goes down to your presentation, fish grabs it, starts swimming off. By simply setting the hook, now you're just trying to catch up all that line, right? So the, the, the old slogan I used to use when I was guiding and what I still tell friends and family when they're in the boat is like, when that bobber disappears and you're bobber dog and it's real till you feel. That hook is almost set when the fish takes it, hits the resistance of the bobber and takes off. The other key indicator is Typically, when you're bobber dogging or float drifting, when the float disappears, if it just goes, just kind of goes down, your hooks or your weight temporarily got into something. It's just kind of grabbed, okay? <coughs> when a fish grabs it, high percentage of the time, the float doesn't just disappear, it takes off at an angle. I mean, it flat out just, it just disappears. It, it gets up and goes, okay? Um, kind of some key indicators you pick up on over time as you bobber dog. Quite a bit. Now, this one here, as Brandon alluded to, you know, uh, and I kind of took this from the fly guys years ago, um, running a single bait or presentation under your float or drift fishing or whatever is one method, but gosh, fly guys have been laying it out there for years with two or three presentations on a single line, right? They're just upping their chances. So, I never fish the same thing uh, when I'm bobber dogging or fishing suspended or what have you. In this case, let me check my next, uh, I think I covered rods. Anybody got questions on rods and reels before I start breaking this down into bait? Yeah. Uh, what power and uh, action do you prefer? Power and action. So typically about a medium on your rod, and I like to fish anywhere like I show here on the slide, 9 foot to 10 and a half. And not brand specific, there's a lot of really good rods out there today. Like we talked about on the show the other night, most folks are more interested in a good rod that feels nice and doesn't break the bank and has a decent warranty program. That's kind of the, the working man's fishing rod, right? So if I'm fishing from shore and doing a lot of bobber fishing, suspended jigs or even bobber dogging, I like a longer rod because it's going to keep your line up off the water. Okay? If you're fishing a 9-foot rod, you can get it done, but if you can, if you can handle a 10-foot rod, it may be to your advantage. When you're in a drift boat, especially you're standing in the bow of the drift boat going down river, you're already elevated up off the water. That's why a nine and a half foot rod for me is like kind of a great crossover. I can use it on the shoreline, I can use it in boats, I'm not hitting the guys and gals that are in the boat with me. It's just a comfortable rod to use. Six to fifteen on your line weight, medium action. Um, I fish braid probably, we'll break down uh, line leader in hooks right now. Um, pretty much braid on every one of these rods. There is even braid on my drift fishing rod, and I used to cuss at guys that would have the audacity to fish braid on the drift fishing rod. But the problem is they tie their braid directly to their swivel, which goes to their weight, and then their leader. Their break-off point in their system is their leader. And for one reason or another, depending how that gets wrapped up underwater, they break off yards of braid at some point, or cut it out of frustration. And then they do leave all that braid in the river. For me, whether it's float fishing or drift fishing, I'm always running at least a 12 to 18, 20 foot top shot of monofilament. If I'm drift fishing, and the key on drift fishing with braid is because it telegraphs so well. You can really fill up your tab and bottom. You can literally go, oh, those are big rocks, or oh, that feels like pea gravel, or that feels like mud. And if I'm fishing mud or sand, I'm moving because fish don't like sand in their gills, right? So you're allowing the bottom structure to tell you exactly the type of structure you're fishing in, and you can do it with monofilament, but there's so much more downriver line belly with monofilament, you eliminate all that 
and pick up your sensitivity with braid. Yeah. What's your favorite knot for top shot to mono to your braid? It's a knot that I kind of made up. People ask me that all the time, and I always say, ah, you know, I'm going to make a quick how-to video and, and do this. And it's, it's basically, uh, I don't know, it's a, I'll just have to make a video and show you. It's, it's, it's a knot I kind of made up, and I just, it's reliable. I, I've never broke a fish off on it. I've had to break a handful of times when I really get into something girthy and heavy that I can't pop, and eventually the knot gives. But more times than not, the leader's breaking. And, my, and, I, and I retain my top shot, which is what I want, right? Affect your captain, the The knot? No, no. And for me, if you think about barber dogging, for example, if I have braid, for the majority of the line that's floating on water is going to be above surface, and I have monofilament from the float down because it's going to sink, that's how I want to set up my presentation because it makes sense. That's what the line is engineered to do. Now, if you're drift fishing with braid, go with a smaller diameter so you don't have a lot of water drag and you don't have a lot of float in it after a certain point. I mean, you're going to kind of... It, for me, it works well. I, I will... Level wines, I'm putting at least 40 pound on only because when you get hung up, and I know a lot of you guys have heard me say this before, only because when you get hung up and again, if we're using braid on rods that are rated for 6 to 15, I got 40 pound braid on there. I'm not trying to unsnag by whipping on that thing. I'm reeling down, pointing the rod tip directly at it, and simply pulling straight back. My breaking point is either my top shot or my leader that's hung up into something. Okay, so I'm safe to make sure I'm not going to break my rod by doing something stupid by having 40 pound braid on my level one. The reason I have 40 pound braid on my level line is when you get hung up and you pull that back in, 30 pound test is a pretty thin diameter. And if you pull that extremely tight, I guarantee you, it finds its way way down into your spool. Okay? And if you totally forget about that and you re-rig, the very next time you cast, you're going to throw that out there and whoosh, there goes your weight and your leader and stuff's going to break off and go flying. Um, when you get hung up with braid, you have to not only undo that and retie, but you got to make sure you peel that line out of your spool until you're assured that it's nice and free, so the next time you cast, it's going to come off your spool. You don't necessarily have that problem with a spinning rod. Um, so you go with lighter line on a spinning rod, and I often do. I'll, I'll run maybe 30-pound braid on my spinning rod. I don't like to go lighter than that, because if you do have a little wind whipping around, you're float fishing, and that line is so light, it can, it can rod, uh, rod, wrap your rod tip pretty easily. So I tend to stay with 30s on my spinning rods, 40 or 50 on my level lines. I'll go 50-55 on my diver rods, so just for that, just because it gets in the spool. So, <clears throat> so if you do choose to use braid for your drift fishing, I advocate putting at least 20, 20 feet of top shot on the top of it. Uh, scale that down depending on time of year, fish you're targeting, clarity of water. Um, typically, if I'm running a 40-pound mono on here, uh, early winter steelhead, I might even just put on a 15, <clears throat> 15 or 20 pound top shot and run like a 10 pound leader. There's a break point built into the system. Not everything is of equal strength because it's really hard to get stuff back. Okay? Any questions on that? Okay. Um, double presentation on the, oh, let me do this real quick. Uh, hook sizes, size fours all the way to a size one, size one odd actually as we get into wild fish, depending on what you're rigging. Floats, five eighths to a half ounce, typically gets it done. Clear floats are uh, pretty popular this time of year when the water's so low and gin clear. We do have some rain coming, but right now, if you're out chasing steelhead right now, you are fishing summer conditions, albeit the temperature is substantially colder. But when it comes to clarity flow and um, the size of water you're fishing, we're at we're at summer flows right now, folks. So you have to gear your gear down accordingly, and your presentation has to be of similar techniques, and that's what we're going to cover a little bit here. Um, bobbers are, you know, float dogging. It, these float dogging floats are pretty much small, medium, large, pretty easy to decide. I don't know if I brought any of the the large ones are really huge, and I typically <coughs> for stick lead anymore. I'm sticking with the new uh, Bomac, this hardened foam. Um, with a smaller medium. The medium works really great with a six inch stick lead. This is a five inch and I'll go even with a small lead on that and it just, they complement each other really well. The big ones are really huge. Probably use them for Chinook. Anybody bobber dog for Chinook or Coho? Well you do because, well, oh that kid back there. If you are not bobber dogging for Chinook and Coho you're missing out. 
Not all Chinook like to take eggs just simply suspended under a float. I cannot tell you how many times we walk into a hole, everybody's fishing suspended, and you sit there and watch. This, is a, this reminds me of some of the key points to back up here. Uh, when you're suspended, and you look at a piece of water, and it is comes around the corner, drops into holes, two feet, the main belly of the hole is going to drop in six, eight feet deep, then you start running that tail out, and it, it naturally kind of gains an elevation, comes back up to about two feet, in the elevate, uh, two feet at the end of the tail. Out. If you're fishing suspended at four feet, I'm going to cast it at the top, it's going to drag, it's going to pendulum, that float's going to be straight up and down, it's going to go through the meat of the hole, it's going to be four foot suspended over eight feet of water. And you got Chinook tucking their nose down and they're just hanging out having a good time. Okay? And I've suspended four feet. Now, yes, fish look up. There's no, de there's no denying that. Fish look up. But it may not be a distance they're, they're you know, going to say, I'm going to go up there and get that, whatever it is. Maybe they see it, maybe they don't. So I fish that hole numerous times, don't touch a fish. As it gets towards the tail out, it starts dragging, so I reel in. And I keep doing that. And I don't adjust my depth or anything. Now... The smart fisherman will actually adjust your depth till you get into the meat of that hole and either a fish picks it up or you drag bottom at some point <clears throat> then you go okay and then you bump that back up about a foot or two now you're fishing the hole to where you feel confident you're getting your presentation down if there's fish in there you're going to be in the wheelhouse you have to use your float orientation either vertically or pointing down the river to tell you exactly what the depth of the river is if i'm dragging point down the river i'm dragging right so I bumped that stopper up a couple feet. Now I'm fishing vertical. I've gone through there a couple times. I didn't get anything at four feet. I didn't get anything at six feet. Oh, look at that. I hooked a fish at seven feet. Okay. Then I make a note of that to say the river was flowing 2,500 a day. In this hole, I hooked a fish at seven feet. When I come back and it's flowing 1,500, you might hook a fish at five feet. This is the game we play. Bobber dogging. I can take that same drift, two foot down to six, eight foot, tapers up to two. I can set my float stopper as I naturally do at about eight feet. I throw it in there, and again, it's the lead dragon, not the not the beta presentation. It goes through the hole the whole entire time. The lead's dragon. Where is my presentation the whole entire time? In in where the fish are going to live, right? The only difference is the angle of my line. So as it's shallower, I have my line is laid out more. <laughs> kind of horizontal to where the weight's dragging and the float's at. But as it goes deeper, it naturally kind of starts doing this. It may be real close to being right on top of itself, but if the lead is still dragging, it doesn't matter. We're still in that, we're still in that area we want to live. And then as it gets down deeper in the hole, you're going to see that float lay out a little bit more, and the pendulum's back behind it and drags further, okay? The key there is that I have literally covered that hole in one cast, not knowing the depth. Now, if I go into a hole and I'm bobber dogging and I'm um, set at eight feet and it goes through and I get to that point where the pendulum's straight up and down, what's that telling me? Not, not deep enough. enough. So here, again, I need to slide that up. I go at least a couple <clears throat> feet and now I'm going to drag through and it stays, my bobber stays pointing down river the whole time. Cool. I know I'm covering the wall. Okay. That's the benefits of bobber dogging. In that contour drop like that, I can't tell you how many times Jordan and I have walked into a hole watching everybody fish vertical. Okay, that's cool. He looks at me and he goes, you're getting your barber dog rod, aren't you? Yeah, I'm going to get my barber dog rod. Hey, you guys doing any good? No, I haven't had a bite. Throw it in there, dragon lead, bait in the wheelhouse, fish off. If you're not barber dogging for snook and fellow, you're missing out. If you're fishing bait or beads or whatever you're doing. Okay? Just a little tip. Um, <coughs> so, drift fishing we covered. Uh, two foot leaders. Lots of different things we can drift fish. You can drift fish beads, you can drift fish uh, corkies, you can drift fish, you know, yarnies. These yarnies were great. Um, again, simply by taking a yarny, uh, multicolor strands of yarns tied together above your hook, uh, add some shrimp scent, add some uh, squid, add some type of shrimp anise, but any and all these are going to work. Krill, anything shrimpy, um, guaranteed to probably get a steelhead excited. You notice the difference in colors because again they're visually stimulated and you want to create contrast in your presentations when you're making multiple type baits. My regs, you know, multiple colors. When this gets wet and has the purples and the oranges and the pinks, what do you think it kind of looks like in the water? Sand shrimp? The sand shrimp look to it? Caught a ton of steelhead over the years on purples, oranges, and pinks in combination. It's just natural looking colors, okay? 
Oil them up. Uh, it's going to definitely give it more buoyancy. These, man, it's okay to go craft store with the wife or girlfriend. I gave you permission. Okay, go to the craft store. The market is inundated with beads now. You don't really know need, need to go to the craft store to find beads, but to find different things that look different that nobody else is fishing. These little dudes I found them a few years ago. I bought a couple tubs of them. I still got a bunch of them. You can pass those around. I don't have to sit around and tie yarn balls. And I have fished. I've actually fished those with Brandon. We were fishing beads and dual combinations. And that day I caught more fish down in Oregon on my scented up yarny. Either that cerise looking color or that orange, which in the water looks an awful lot like a glob of eggs, believe it or not, and <coughs> caught plenty of steelhead on those. Now, I heard some folks talking earlier, it's like fishing these double rigs, do you just, uh, you know, tie, tie the line right to the bottom of the hook? Yeah, if you haven't tied a double rig and you want to add something to the bottom, absolutely. So in this instance, and I'll get into these baits a little bit later, um, Spawn bags are something that the East Coast has used forever and a day. I always told those guys they were idiots to scrape perfectly good eggs out of a skein only to tie them back up in a little sack. I'm like, what is wrong with you guys? Why don't you just cut a chunk of bait off and fish it, right? And, and to be truthful, guys back there that I had the opportunity uh, years ago to go fish with multiple times with uh, Team Potsky, they would literally scrape their raw eggs off the skein, tie them in spawn sacks and fish them. And they would get five, six drifts out of their presentation, and then the eggs would be all milked out and white, and they'd pull that bag off and put another one on. So we said, did you guys ever think about curing your eggs? And we took Baraxo Fire and a few other things, showed them how to cure the eggs, then tie the spawn bags, and now they're getting 15 drifts out of their spawn bag. And that was the evolution of guys in the Great Lakes fisheries and all those folks chasing after the fish we gave them years ago back in the 60s. <laughs> uh, those are our salmon and steelhead over there, if you didn't know that. Um, they started fishing their spawn bags with cured row versus just natural row, okay? But I don't use a lot of salmon or steelhead eggs for steelhead fishing anymore. The artificials work great, and when I do use bait, these are tied out of uh, Potsky's trout eggs. Three different colors for color contrast. I throw in some of uh, Mike's little uh, floaty pills, give it a little buoyancy. I tie it in the pre-cut. You can get in the spool, okay? But I get the pre-cut ones. I literally take one of those, I lay it in the lid of the jar of eggs upside down because it makes a little, <clears throat> excuse me, a little catch basin for the eggs. And I'll drop three or four of red, three or four of orange deluxe, three or four of the natural <clears throat> shrimp color. I'll put in two, three, four of the floaties and I tie that little spawn bag off with a magic thread. Just whip it around there and break. You don't even need to tie a half hitch. It just bites into itself. Snip the end off, and you have yourself a little spawn bag of trout eggs. You guys are going to call me a liar, but I've literally had these that I've tied up. And I soaked them in a combination of nectar, which is nothing more than the Potsky's 100% natural egg juice. So I'm soaking eggs in egg juice. I add in some liquid krill, because it mixes really well, because it's liquid. And I add in a few drops of anise. So it's uh, nectar anise krill. I wrote an article on it years ago. I called it NAK, NAK, and it was, it was kind of a play on words. You got a knack for fishing. So they literally sit there in the knack. <coughs> I took these, um, I had them in my fridge for at least, at least two years. They didn't mold. They don't go bad. Nothing happens to them because these eggs are cooked, right? These are the Posky trout eggs that you buy in the jar that are cooked. So because they've been cooked and preserved, I put them in a spawn bag, I soak them in the liquid. I had them in my fridge for two years, went out fishing one day, caught six steelhead on them. Bobber dogging, those little gummies right there, yep. Can you freeze them as well? I've never froze them, and I don't, you don't need to. Right. If bait lasts in your fridge for two years, would you really have a reason to freeze it? No. Exactly. So um, those along with uh, the coon shrimp that I cure up will last you a couple years because of the recipe and you're, you're basically pickling them. So some baits definitely last longer. There's, there's a reason I don't really waste time fishing my cured <coughs> eggs for steelhead anymore because I save those for salmon fishing. I save them for Chinook and Coho. These little things, you can sit around, tie up a handful of those in no time, and they last in your fridge forever and they work really well for steelhead. Yes? And you said you did that with 
What's that? You said you did that with Anna. Yeah, so it's a combination of the nectar, which is egg juice, the liquid krill, and some anise in there. And uh, I know when we get done here, I'm going to leave those containers open. You guys come up and smell this stuff. You're going to be like, oh, yeah. But the nice thing is I can take this little spawn bag. I don't even have to worry about putting in an egg loop or anything. I just run the hook right through there and literally just hang that on the hook. And that will fish. If I'm bobber dogging that down the river in my drift boat, I will literally fish that for 20, 30 minutes. It's got a lot of scent in there. It's been soaking for two years, for God's sakes. It's not like it's been, you know. And it's durable because the eggs are cooked and they're retained within a small bag. So they can bounce off rocks and do whatever, but it's just a very durable little bait that works really well. That would be the equivalent of like a side drifting rig. It's just a little double uh, size four hook and a little cheater in there. Plenty of buoyancy. And I'll fish that solo, but sometimes, you know what? I'm of the old school that size of presentation and... Scent and color is one thing, or scent and color is one thing, but size of presentation. Sometimes I drag one of them little fly bugs behind it, a single egg, and just have that as a double rig going down the river. And that's a little size four hook that they that they tie. You know, a lot of the fly guys use these little fly bugs, but I had a guy show me one day. He's like, I'm just going to drag a couple of these, and he was hooking steelhead on these. And ever since then, 10 plus years ago, it was a game changer. If I want to have a small profile, something that is just, you know, it's hardly even there. Yeah, you'll catch trout and cutthroat and other smaller fish on this, but it's an artificial, you do nothing with it other than just add it to your arsenal and let it drag. And you're already, you know, you got this nice bait presentation out there, so that one there is just a bonus. And it's pretty easy to tie double rigs, and more times than not, when I'm bobber dogging, I have some type of double rig that I'm, that I'm definitely dragging. So just food for thought there. Any questions on those little spawn bags? I got a better picture of them later. And we can talk about this stuff later. Easy, easy bait to make works very well.